I'm Matt at Nexus Baseball, and this is episode one of the Tommy John Epidemic. This series is a YouTube read of content from the book Plague of the Gods, an outsider's perspective on baseball's Tommy John Epidemic, which is available on Amazon. I decided to put this content on YouTube to make the material as accessible as possible. The series examines the science behind the most superhuman action the human body can produce, accelerating a baseball up to 100 miles per hour. This action occurs faster than the human eye can follow. It creates up to 9,000 degrees a second of shoulder rotation and spin on the ball equal to the spin rate of a buzzsaw. The result is the pitch and the excitement of the game of baseball. But this action seemingly comes with a cost. Every year, thousands of kids, as well as many professional pitchers, go down with elbow injuries. What was once a manageable risk of injury has exploded since 2012 into an injury epidemic, putting unprecedented numbers of amateurs and professional pitchers under the knife. The dreaded diagnosis, UCL damage, and the required Tommy John surgery. This surgery often causes years of pain and loss of function, ending many careers before they even begin. It is alarming that even with nearly infinite resources, professional baseball has been unable to mitigate, much less solve, the issue of pitching injuries. The conclusion is that much of the baseline science and instruction on throwing the baseball is simply incorrect. It does not correlate with what is happening on the field and what professional pitchers are actually doing. This series looks at the fundamental question of how velocity of the baseball pitch is generated by the body. For example, why can a string bean 160 pound pitcher maybe throw 95 miles per hour effortlessly, but a 240 pound pitcher might struggle with 90 miles per hour? To answer that question, the book delves deep into the physics and anatomy of the body. Subjects are covered in, a, in an understandable and engaging manner using diagrams, illustrations, and dozens of pictures of professional pitchers. This series is targeted at any fan of the game of baseball that wants to look beneath the surface, as well as any coach, pitcher, or parent of a pitcher looking to enhance their knowledge and prevent injury. October 14, 2015, Game 5 of the American League Division Series. A roller coaster benches clearing 7th inning continues with Jose Batista stepping into the box to bat. A 1-1, 97 mile per hour pitch from Texas Rangers closer Sam Dyson hits Jose's bat with a thunderclap and launches into the left field seats. Jose stands motionless for a second and then flips his bat as Rogers Center in Toronto explodes into a roar. Standing in my strength and conditioning training studio in Toronto with a couple clients, Time seemed to stop as we jumped up and down ecstatically. I've always loved baseball since I was a kid. Fortunately, it was a great time to be a baseball fan in Toronto. Just after I celebrated my first birthday in 1985, the Blue Jays turned into perennial contenders, culminating in back-to-back -back World Series titles in 1992 and 1993. I'll always remember watching the 1991 All-Star Game at Skydome with my dad after winning the tickets in a fan contest. Watching on with a childish sense of wonder as a six-year-old, I couldn't understand how a person could accomplish the superhuman feats that my heroes on the diamond could. I collected baseball cards and watched all the Blue Jays games I was able to. Unfortunately, I didn't have a notable playing career, going only as far as elementary school ball. Being an unremarkable youth athlete and dealing with a variety of health issues, playing at higher levels was never much of a consideration at the time. This didn't dampen my enthusiasm much until surgery as a 16 year old to correct a chest depression that resulted that was limiting my lung capacity resulted in a near fatal infection. The multi-year recovery precluded athletics for the rest of high school, shutting the door it seemed on sports entirely. After foregoing athletics for several years, I became deeply disappointed at having lost my athletic opportunities in favor of academic ones. Now in university, I made a resolution to change that and consider joining the military as a replacement for sport. I attacked physical fitness head on, choosing one of the most difficult goals I could think of, scoring a perfect score on the Marine Corps physical fitness test. It was a grueling challenge, consisting of 100 push-ups and 100 sit-ups, each completed in under two minutes, as well as 20 dead hang pull-ups and a three mile run in under 18 minutes. I started training at 19, and by 20 I completed my goal, putting in a full year of effort. In great shape and in my final couple years of university, I decided against the service and looked for a sport I could continue to compete in after finishing my education. Just as before, I chose to challenge myself, 
walking into a mixed martial arts gym. I took to the challenge and balanced school and keeping regular employment with developing as an amateur MMA fighter. I specialized in boxing, attracted to the, develop the concept of developing lightning quick hand speed and the definitive ending of the knockout punch. Although by this point a competent athlete, I discovered my greatest advantage was my analytical approach and my determination. I watched hundreds of hours of tape to find the strategies used by the most competitive fighters. I studied every technique and every strength and con conditioning program I could get my hands on, always trying to maximize myself for the sport. I adhered to a strict training regimen and a rigid nutrition program, attempting to develop a competitive edge. To maximize my ability to train consistently and leverage my passion into income, I started training clients in boxing and strength training using the techniques I had developed. Although competitive, I ran into several roadblocks in my plan to go professional and become a full-time athlete. The most important one being that the sport was illegal at the time in my home province of Ontario. As a sport, MMA is still incredibly young and at the time there was no regulating body in the province of Ontario to license bouts. The only option was unregulated bouts on native reserves facing untested athletes who were routinely on steroids or might carry hepatitis or other bloodborne diseases. All for chump change fight purses. As a natural athlete with hopes for the future, I refused to go this road. Instead, I continued training for several years and achieved a professional fighting license in Las Vegas, home of the UFC MMA organization. Opportunities for a pro debut in Las Vegas never materialized, however, as I had to balance my desire to compete with a growing training business. The prospect of a multi-month fight camp and few initial financial rewards had to be weighed against closing my facility for months and the financial repercussions that entailed. Truthfully, after eight years of training and developing my skill set, by 2012, my heart wasn't in it anymore. I was tired of the realities of a sport that paid its professionals on the highest stage as little as $6,000 for three months of work in exchange for a high risk of permanent injury. It wasn't until after I stopped training that the US, UFC finally put in an independent drug testing program. My passion for MMA tempered, I decided to box to stay in shape while building my training business based on scientific training methods. I leveraged my boxing training methods uh, and focus specifically on rotational power and how it could be developed in athletes of a variety of different sports. After several years of working as a dedicated strength and conditioning coach, it was October 2015 and I was watching Jose Batista make Toronto sports history. At 31 years of age, I felt like a kid again. Although I had still been going to baseball games in the intervening years, this moment felt different and I realized how much I'd been missing my passion for baseball. How the game ebbed and flowed from pastoral calm to a flurry of intensity within a heartbeat. It's funny how life works, but I felt like I was called to participate somehow in the sport of my childhood. And for the first time in almost 20 years, I picked up a baseball. At first, I imagined adding some baseball training into my existing training regiments. But then I started looking at the kids game in depth with more discerning adult eyes. And I saw a sport that could be played by any body type with power created by efficiency of one's biomechanics. I quickly went down the rabbit hole that is baseball. I researched everything from saber metrics to spin rates. I made the determination in the first weeks that I would start training both pitching and hitting. I figured I could train both heading into the winter months in Toronto, indoors, in my own facility. Of course, as before, I chose the most challenging possible approach, deciding to train as both a switch hitter and a switch pitcher. This continued from boxing, as I enjoyed being effective from both orthodox and southpaw stances, and the balance and advantages that came from being able to change at will. Although not naturally ambidextrous, I, as I am both right hand and eye dominant, I always believed in the efficacy of balance in the body and not becoming hyper-specialized with one-handedness. After all, when training with weights, one would never just do more exercises or focus on one arm or leg more than the other. I have always believed that imbalances create weakness in one's physique that can exhibit as injuries. Anecdotally, I've had success with this approach. 
as I have never had a significant injury, even while training in the injury plague sport of MMA. Join me for part two next week, where I cover the next step of my journey of research and discovery. Remember, if you like the content, please subscribe. Your support makes this work possible. Also, if you want to jump ahead, please consider picking up the book on Amazon using the link in the description below. See you next week.